Hello everyone, my name is Martin. I'm an iOS engineer at LiveSport and the rest you've heard. <laughs> and today I will tell you a bit about practical multi-platform development, basically how we do it at LiveSport. So in today's presentation, I will be talking mainly about Kotlin multi-platform. I will be talking about uh, some uh, shared code or the code which we share at LiveSport. Then we will have some practical examples and some future lookout where to go next with the technology. So, the first chapter, Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. Before we dive into the topic, let me ask you a few questions. Who has heard about Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile? Okay, majority of you. Who has used the technology? Okay, and who has deployed it into production? Okay, very few hands, but maybe we will change it today. So, what is the technology about? Uh, Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile is, a, is an SDK uh, developed by JetBrains, the same company which stands behind the whole IntelliJ ecosystem. Uh, and uh, basically you write uh, shared code in Kotlin, the same Kotlin which Android devs already know. Uh, it provides native performance apart from frameworks like Fra Flutter, which you may know, and it has regular support. J JetBrains is known for uh, regular releases of their, their development environments and all the technology which they develop. But uh, Kotlin multi-platform is still in beta. Now we should uh, stop a bit and uh, speak about why is it in beta. It's not beta because it's, not, it's broken, but it's in beta because some APIs may change. But f from our uh, experience, they don't change, at least not in the past or in the last year. And they have promised to release a stable version this year. So how does a Kotlin multi-platform project look like? It consists at least out of three parts. You may have uh, business logic and all the code which you wanna share between two platforms in one shared space. And on top of that, or next to it, you can have iOS and Android codes, which can access uh, platform-specific APIs. On top of that, usually you have a UI uh, layers, uh, of course, uh, UI kit or Swift UI layers on iOS platform, and Compose uh, layer on top of uh, the Android platform. So, is it really production ready? Uh, there are already big names who use Kotlin multi-platform mobile. We can name, for example, Netflix or Philips, but there, there are other companies. TouchLab, which is a leading uh, uh, solution provider, or uh, they cre basically create frameworks for the whole community. And of course, we at LiveSport uh, want to be with these companies. Uh, so, which parts of the code uh, we share? Let me ask uh, you a few questions again. Uh, who of you is an Android developer? Not even the half? iOS engineers? Okay, any designers here? Product managers, product owners? No one, okay. So, uh, let's first uh, get a glimpse of what we at LiveSport do. Do you know our application? Who has LiveSport app on their phones? Few hands raised. Okay, we are uh, a Czech-based company. Actually, we have headquarters in Prague. And of course, we have another office here in Brno. Uh, our core product is called FlashScore. And in the Czech Republic, it's uh, called LiveSport. It may be called differently in other companies, but it's the same product. And the product is about live scores, uh, 
basically you can track your favorite teams, your favorite players. And the most recent feature was uh, or is called uh, LiveSport News, which we released last year. The product is uh, distributed globally. We have over 1 million active monthly users. And we are available on, of course, Android and iOS. That's why are we all here. And we have uh, web, uh, websites for desktop and mobile. Out of those 100 millions, we have 9 million iOS users and roughly 22 million Android users. Now to the technical part. Uh, before I tell you about the shared code, we need to know the basics of our architecture, which we use in both our uh, platforms. It's called view state architecture. Basically, you have a model or something like a model which provides you view state. It's the data which are displayed by UI layer. And the UI layer is kind of stupid because it doesn't have any, uh, uh, basically it doesn't make any transformations to the data. Uh, we also use something which is called a unidirectional flow. You may know architectures like Redux. But in our case, we use on iOS something which is called composable architecture. It's a framework, open source framework, uh, developed by Point3 guys. Anyone knows the framework? Anyone uses the framework? OK, a few hands. That's great. Um, uh, and on, uh, on Android platform, the whole architecture is part of the Compose framework. And another, another keyword which you should know is a single point of entry. You send the data to some uh, black box and you get a data in form of view state. The whole architecture out of, is out of scope of this presentation, but if you want to uh, check a great resource, there's a video on YouTube which I would recommend you to check out. Uh, now to the shared part. And I will provide you later with uh, uh, links to all resources, so don't worry if you haven't scanned the code yet. Uh, this is a uh, current state which probably any mobile developer knows. You have a backend and two applications. You need to write the whole code twice. Uh, wouldn't it be better to not repeat the code and just write it once and use twice? That's exactly what we do with KMM. Uh, KMM stands for Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. I will be using it interchangeably. So KMM, Multiplatform, Kotlin Multiplatform, that's the same thing. Let's look inside uh, the multi-platform uh, framework. Uh, the backend, uh, in our case, uh, is something like huge data storage. We just ask for data and it serves the latest uh, match, uh, match data, player data, and so on. Inside KMM, uh, we have a networking layer. For networking, we use uh, technology GraphQL and there's already uh, a multi-platform framework called Gra Apollo GraphQL, which easily integrates into your multi-platform projects. And uh, basically, you generate all of your backend models. And as I said, you write it once, use twice. Then we have data storage. For that, we use a library called Dropbox Store. Uh, this library, uh, uh, does two things for us. It caches the data because we don't want to uh, make too many requests to our backends. And it and if you if we don't have the data in the cache, it redirects uh, the request to networking layer. Uh, the data come to other parts of uh, multi-platform framework in the form or are provided by flows. 
For iOS developers, a flow is something like combined publisher. And then we have the business logic, so we do all the data transformations and so on and so on. And uh, the data go out in a form of view state, as I mentioned previously. Uh, then, of course, you can have other things in the whole multi-platform project. So we share analytics, we share configurations for our sports, which we cover over. We cover about 40 sports in our in our application and other utility functions. And as you can see, uh, the UI layer stands completely outside of the whole KMM framework. Uh, so now. Practical examples. We know what is the architecture. We know uh, uh, what happens inside KMM. Now let's ha have a look on uh, snippets of the code. For this example, I have chosen the news feature, the, the news feature which I mentioned at the beginning. Here we have a main page with a list of articles and op on top you can see there's a slider where you can pick different topic pages. For now let's focus on a single article. In this case we have something which is called news article large, basically one large article. Uh, for our designs, we use Figma and our designers decided to uh, implement uh, atomic design system. Therefore, they provide us uh, with uh, atomic components inside Figma and we as developers uh, write or use the components to write code which exactly represents the Figma uh, components. And that's exactly what's on the right side. Uh, it's a data class, uh, which has the same name as the component in Figma. It has, of course, an image. There's also title, and we can have some metadata. Uh, so this uh, component model, or as, uh, the whole news article large component model, is part of KMM framework and uh, it's shared between both platforms. That's really important for now. Let's move forward. For next example, I have chosen a uh, article detail. It's another screen, so if you tap on uh, the large article, the screen opens. And again, it consists out of multiple components. Uh, th those components are arranged in a vertical stack. That's important for a bit later. And let's focus on a component which is called a Perex. Basically the Perex is something which contains the most in important information out of the article. Uh, we have two UI implementation, implementations. The first one is from Android. It's the Compose component. And you can see uh, in this layer, we set uh, the colors of the text, the uh, font sizes, and so on. And the same component is, of course, represented in SwiftUI. You can see the codes are very similar, though they have some, uh, uh, some changes to it. But there's one part which is of course the same, and that's the model from the previous example. The model defined as a data class in Kotlin project. Uh, now we have multiple components on the article detail. Uh, it's now easy to lay them all out below each other. And for that, uh, we used list on iOS, basically you you have an array of components, you put them in a list and check the type and according to the type you lay out the specific UI component. The same happens on Android, just written in Kotlin. And yet again, there's a shared part in the form of array or if you wish a list of UI component models. Uh, 
so we have the UI, now we want to interact with the UI. In this example, I'm going to use the topic slider on top of the main screen. The, uh, the slider is, of course, uh, you can drag it sideways, but we are interested in the tap action. What happens when we tap uh, on a different topic? As I told you, it's unidirectional flow, single point of entry, we send an action to Kotlin multi-platform. It's processed inside, so either it's taken from the cache or a request is sent to the backend. Data are processed and returned back to the UI layer in a form of stream of uh, component models. And of course, you can return other metadata like selected tab, the number of the selected tab. So that's the practical example. And of course, you may have noticed I wasn't talking about sharing other things uh, like resources, for example. I want to mention a few uh, very promising technologies, few promising frameworks in this chapter, which we don't completely use, but they deserve your attention. Uh, first of them is Moco Resources. It's a, an op open source library. You can find it on GitHub. And it allows you to share all the text resources like fonts, uh, strings and so on. Of course, it provides APIs for images and colors. The only change for iOS developers if they write code into uh, the shared Kotlin multi-platform project is that resources aren't contained in, uh, in asset catalogs, but are written inside XMLs, which is more common for the whole Android platform. Another library is called Kotlin Native Coroutines. Uh, probably every Android developer knows what coroutines means, but uh, for us iOS developers, it's something like whole framework for parallel work, uh, uh, reactive programming and other stuff. Uh, uh, we are, as iOS developers, used to functions with completions. The same or very similar thing on Android inside the coroutines framework is suspend functions. Once you write a suspend function, compile the multi-platform project, you get a function with a completion inside uh, your uh, iOS projects. Nowadays, we usually or we want to use async await. It's quite new technology, but already uh, has some penetration inside all the iOS codes. Uh, it doesn't happen natively, but if you use Kotlin native coroutines framework, you get it kind of for free. Uh, basically, it consists out of wrappers. The same applies to flows. As I told you, flow is something like a publisher on iOS, so you can't use it uh, natively, uh, but uh, you need to make a wrapper which is in the Kotlin native coroutines framework. Maybe I haven't mentioned why. Uh, the whole uh, multi-platform framework is accessible through Objective-C headers. And because Objective-C doesn't have any support for async await, combined, pub pub combined publishers, SwiftUI, and so on, there needs to be some work done. Uh, and the last technology which I want to mention is Compose Multiplatform. It's the newest uh, technology uh, in the whole Kotlin Multiplatform ecosystem. And actually, an alpha version for iOS was released last month. Uh, uh, the whole technology is moving rapidly, and we expect big things from it. Uh, but for now, uh, we don't use it at Lysport. Uh, uh, I want to mention that uh, the UI, which is shared by a Compose multi-platform, is in form of UI kit views. And of course, as you are used to, you can wrap it inside UI view controller representable and use it in Swift UI code. There are some examples online. For example, uh, last DroidCon application was written completely via 
uh, Compose multi-platform. So once you write <laughs> Compose multi-platform application, the code on iOS platform is like 10 lines for the whole, whole app and you get the same native performance. Uh, there's one last tool which I want to mention, Xcode, Xcode Kotlin pl plugin. It allows you to uh, debug uh, Kotlin code inside Xcode. You can set breakpoints, you can inspect vari variables inside Xcode and it ju works just fine. And the last resource is John O'Reilly's blog. Uh, the guy writes uh, about the newest things uh, in Kotlin multi-platform world. And he has lots of examples on his blog and on GitHub. So I'm going to give you all the resources on this link. So uh, scan it if you want to. and you will get one more chance at the beginning, at the end of the presentation. So let's sum up. Uh, let's sum up uh, the live sport experience with Kotlin multi-platform. Uh, over the past year, uh, we have implemented uh, more than uh, 700 uh, files in Kotlin multi-platform mobile, which saved us a lot of code which w normally would be written twice on each platform. Uh, and of course, we write unit tests. Who writes unit tests? Yeah, majority. Shame on you, who hasn't raised the hand. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, yet again, these tests are written just once and cover the code for both platforms. Then it's about time saving. Uh, when we were implementing uh, uh, the news feature inside both of our mobile platforms, uh, the iOS platform started about uh, two months later after Android, but both platforms released the feature on the same day with the same feature set in the same quality and basically, we saved two months on iOS. Uh, it's also about cooperation. Not only cooperation between iOS and Android teams, because at LiveSport, both our teams sit in the same office. Uh, we talk with each other daily. But also, once we were implementing uh, components into multi-platform, we were talking more and more with our designers. And we see it as a key to the success of our uh, news feature and other following features, of course, in the future. Uh, and the last thing, it's competitive advantage. Uh, you will be seeing more and more uh, job descriptions where iOS developers are required to uh, have knowledge about Kotlin multi-platform mobile. It's already happening. Uh, Believe me, you won't be an early adopter if you start using uh, Kotlin multi-platform mobile nowadays. But it's not late for you to jump in the game. And if you want to sell it to your product managers, to, to your stakeholders at your company, tell them basically it's all about money. You are saving money to your company if you write less code and you uh, deliver uh, features faster. So let's recap the content of the presentation. Uh, the technology is here, it's production ready. We have it in production and it's not uh, uh, hard for you to start uh, putting it in your applications. The languages which we already use on both platforms are very, very similar. Uh, so it's not hard for iOS developers to start writing uh, code in Kotlin. Hopefully, also Android developers will be writing some code in Swift in the future. Maybe not, if uh, Compose multi-platform kills Swift, who knows. Uh, it's very easy to integrate. I haven't mentioned it at the beginning, but our application is over 10 years old. 
So we have parts of code which is written in Objective C. Of course, nowadays we use uh, Swift. But uh, if you have new project or old project, you can use Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. Uh, and lastly, there's plenty of uh, third-party libraries which you can put into your project. It will definitely save you save you time. You won't make so many mistakes as we did because last year or uh, one year ago there wasn't so many libraries. So go for it. And uh, my message to all of you is: iOS developers don't be scared to use Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. And message to Android developers, don't be afraid to help your iOS developer to set up the project and start the things moving. So guys, just do it. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than eager to answer them. Maybe we can have a few questions right now. And thank you for having me here. How do you handle platform, platform specific code like uh, front-end permissions, Bluetooth, uh, hardware access, etc.? Mm -hmm. Okay, for now it's handled on both platforms, but I think it's specific for our application because we don't have uh, hardware uh, or we don't have need to use hardware like camera or Bluetooth in our applications. But you can do it in the platform part of the Kotlin multi-platform project. There are o there are already APIs accessible from Kotlin. And where does it fit in your architecture? Is it in the UI layer or some? So I would say it would be a service inside Kotlin multi-platform. Basically the UI layer doesn't have any logic. And so, and, sorry. No, no, you, you can uh, answer. So, uh, so, the, the, so do you have some common interface in KMM? And then there are separate implementations in Swift and in Kotlin for Android. Oh, you mean for uh, this logic? Services for this platform. Oh, you platform. can completely hide it inside if you want to, like the yeah, whole implementation. The, and the Swift code for iOS. Yeah, so you can do it via uh, common protocol. Yeah, and expect actual, which is uh, you can uh, write expect implementation uh, inside the shared part, and expect implementation and actual implementation in the spe uh, platform specific part. Okay.